the My Fishing Cape Cod podcast. Brought to you by the Goose Hummock Shops, Cape Cod's largest outdoor outfitter. Serving New England since 1946. Shop them online at themightyfish.com. Welcome to the My Fishing Cape Cod podcast. The My Fishing Cape Cod podcast is your local source for the latest news and information on fishing Cape Cod. Now, here's your host, Kevin Collins. Well, hello and welcome to another edition of the My Fishing Cape Cod podcast here from MyFishingCapeCod.com. This is your host, Kevin Collins, coming at you with episode number two of our MFCC summer podcast season. And it's a thrill to be back with you once again. We've got another great show. We're taping on Saturday, July 25th, and we're going to be led off by MFCC founder and creator Ryan Collins. We're then going to be joined by Bruno Demir from down at Cape and Islands, Mitsubishi. And last but not least, we're going to be joined by our good friend Phil Howarth, who also joined us last week from down at the Goose Hummock Shops in Orleans. So a jam-packed show for you, full of information today. And let's lead it off with our first guest. Well, joining us right off the top of the show on the phone, like he always does, MFCC founder and creator Ryan Collins. Ryan, how are you on this beautiful morning? I'm doing great, Kevin. Another awesome weekend, beautiful summer weather. I'm trying to enjoy every single day here during late July. Absolutely, me as well. I can't wait to get outdoors and get down on the beach later today. But let's dive right in to our fishing report this week. I know the forum has been busy, a lot of people buzzing in there. Right off the top of the show, I want to ask you about an item, a 54-inch halibut that we've heard of that's been caught this week. Yeah, this was pretty awesome. This was caught on July 21st, so Tuesday of this past week, by Carlton Geckler and his crew out near the Regal Sword east of Chatham. They had been tuna fishing earlier in the day. They reported seeing a few bites happen, but it was kind of slow, so they decided to start trying to jig for cod when they hooked what they thought was a small tuna. But like you said, ended up being an absolutely spectacular 54-inch long halibut. He posted the photo to the forum. Beautiful fish. You know, halibut were heavily, heavily fished during colonial times. But nowadays, they're a pretty rare catch for recreational anglers. So it's just awesome to see this fish being caught. Awesome catch. And Ryan, I've heard from my network of guys down here in the southern part of Plymouth that the canal kind of heated up a little bit early in the week and now is quieting back down a little bit. What have you been hearing about the canal over the past week since we've last visited? Pretty similar to what you heard, Kevin. I know there's been some big fish caught here and there, you know, occasional topwater blitz if you're in the right spot at the right time in the morning. So, for example, I know Lamont Lopes, He got a nice 40-inch fish this week. Jason Coleman, another member, got a a 38-incher down there. And Rick Landry, another member, posted in the forum that he got a 37-inch. Frank Mead got a 41-inch. So it seems like, you know, the early mornings have been a pretty good bet for topwater action. You know, I'm sure somebody will listen to this and then go down there tomorrow and not see anything and be like, well, what the heck, Ryan? But if you're not in the right spot at the right time, you know, you you got to think nothing's going on, but a mile down the canal, somebody just gets lucky and they hit that top water bite. Mm. A little bit more reliable might be jigging the canal at night, and that's just a always a great technique during the summer. And like we've talked about during the afternoons in previous podcasts, chunking bait can be a good bet. So I get, I think the moral of the story, Kevin, is there are big fish around right now for sure. They're definitely settling into the area. I don't think it's a giant biomass like in previous years, but there are big fish around. So the canal is one of those places, even when nothing's happening. If you haven't seen a fish break all day long, you're still casting your bait into 40, 50, 60 feet of water. Anything can happen, and there are big fish around. So definitely have confidence if you head down there. Let's do a little brief surf casting report, Ryan. What are you hearing from the surf cast bite? Well, I personally didn't hit the beach this past week. We'll get into what I did in just a moment. But I did notice in the forum that David Hoganson and his son, they've been catching schoolies from the beaches of Cape Cod Bay, which is 
pretty much what I'm hearing right now. Schoolies from the beaches in Cape Cod Bay. But the interesting thing that happened to them the other night was that they got a hickory shad. This was on Thursday in Cape Cod Bay. The shad took an olive surf candy teaser. So that's pretty cool to see. I've caught a few hickory shad from the beaches in Cape Cod Bay in my lifetime. But when I say a few, I really do mean like two or three. So it's always cool when you catch one of those. And they always seem to hit like little small jigs, little teasers, or like a little curly tail. Aside from that, I know down in Chatham, the beaches are still, or not not the outer Cape beaches. I don't know about them. Maybe Phil can let you know how those are fishing but like stage harbor area for example i know there's still schoolies down there frank mead got a nice 25 26 inch bass fishing that area aside from stripers i do know some people from my fishing cape cod along the south side beaches are hooking sharks so that's always an option too earlier this week ryan you and i talked and you went out with a good buddy of ours captain steve leary of wingman charters out of barnstable harbor how was that trip that was your typical Cape Cod Bay summer trip. You know, it, it really was. It was a good trip. We had a great crew. And we started by high-speed trolling hoochies, which are squid imitation lure on wire line. And when I say high speed, I mean Captain Steve was really moving quick. We were going six, seven miles per hour. We had hoochies on wire. He also had some hoochies out on the outriggers along the surface. We picked up some fish that way, and then we switched over to jigging wire, jigging red and black jigs. I think we used purple and black as well, and that produced schoolies. It also produced a nice 36-inch fish as well as one slot fish, so that was a uh, cool trip, and that's pretty much during the summer. you got to be willing to use wire, especially on those really hot summer days if you're going to be fishing during the afternoon. Light core line, tube and worm is also a good bet for sure. But using wire really helps you get your baits down, and sometimes that's the only way to catch them. So it was a good learning experience for me because I've never trolled hoochies before the way that Captain Steve did. And I think everyone, you know, had a pretty good day. So that was a, a good trip. How about a uh, Martha's Vineyard update, Ryan? Have you been hearing anything from over on the island? I don't have a huge network over on the vineyard, but I did notice that Matt Nightingale, who's a member, he posted in the forum that he had some good luck fishing around Waysque Point. That was on July 24th this past week. He was trolling Yozuri's at about four knots, and he landed around 10 bluefish, a sea bass, and even a fluke. So that's pretty cool. Um, but aside from that, that's really all I've heard about the vineyard. I'm sure there's some, probably some nice fish being caught in the summertime spots, like Devil's Bridge, Squib Knocket area. But I don't know for sure, Kevin. I don't have any firsthand experience. And last but not least on my list for you this week, Ryan, are the canyons. We talked a very little bit about it with Phil from the Goose Hummock last week. Uh, He might have some more intel this week. I'm definitely going to hit him up later in the podcast because I know he likes heading out there with Team Goose. But have you heard anything about the canyons? Yes, I have. I got a message yesterday from Ted and Kurt Saracino. And those are the guys that I usually fish the canyons with. And they've been members of the site for several years now. They went out to Beach Canyon this past week, and they got a big eye tuna. They got a bunch of yellowfin tunas, and that was just on a day trip. So I'm guessing they probably only trolled for like five, six hours. Then I went on the forum this morning, and I noticed that Sean Ross hooked a blue marlin at Beach this past week. He also got about a half dozen yellowfin. And William Branos posted that he had an epic trip out there at Beach with Giacomo Charters. So there's definitely some action happening out there at the canyons. I know it's a long haul and it's out of reach for most of us, but it's just cool to know that there is so much life way out there in the Gulf Stream. Well, Ryan, before I let you go, what's on the docket, you know, for this weekend and the early part of next week? Got anything planned fishing-wise? You know, I uh, I don't really know what I'm going to do, which is kind of cool because I don't have too much on the calendar that I need to do. So I'm just got to see what opportunities present themselves, whether it's taking the little 12-foot boat out fluke fishing or maybe for stripers. 
I've even heard of there being some nice schools of pogies around. So I might try to check those out, see if there's some big bass below them. But I don't know, Kevin, just trying to enjoy late July in this weather because before you know it, I hate to say it, but fall will be here. So I'm soaking up every summer day for everything it's worth. Well, that's good advice, Ryan, for all the members out there. Thank you so much for sharing some of your weekend with us, and we look forward to catching up with you in in the near future. I'll talk to you soon. Well, next up on this week's edition of the My Fishing Cape Cod podcast is our good buddy Bruno Demir from Cape and Islands, Mitsubishi. Bruno, how are you on this beautiful Saturday morning? I'm awesome. Hello, MFCC members. For once, I'm not on the water. I'm actually in the mountains in New Hampshire taking the family on a little weekend getaway and uh, just acting like one of the Griswolds. <laughs> Exactly. You're you're a true American family man, Bruno. But um, have you had a chance to get out and do any fishing at all this week? Yeah, I I did. And uh, I got a lot of close friends that also spent a lot of time on the water. So uh, we got some good intel for you guys. So let's dive right into it. A few members have asked us about fluke fishing, and you've shared with us your passion for fluke fishing. And you've talked a lot about the Nantucket Shoals. Can you provide a a little bit of a fishing report on the shoals and and give us some pointers for folks that may want to take a stab at fluke fishing the shoals by boat? Well, it's it's certainly the fluke capital of the world. Um, But I just, you know, one little bit of advice, just make sure you put safety first because you want to make sure you go out there on a really nice calm day because the the shoals can get really dicey and it calls for a long ride home. Uh, if you pick the wrong weather, been there, done that. But that being said, um, here's what I would do if you want some fluke on the shoals. First thing first, you want to hit big round shoal, the very southern point between the 8 and 10 can. You get a drop off there where it goes from 20 to 70 feet. You just want to work that column. On the incoming tide, you want to be up on the bank in 20, 25 feet. On outgoing tide, you want to be in the deeper water. Now, you might not get the biggest storm out there, but you'll definitely hit your limit on most days. If that doesn't work, you take a trip a little more south, and you hit McBlair. And then the McBlair is, uh, I think it's only like, what, five miles, four miles from uh, Big Round Shoals Southern Point. So that's your next stop. Uh, you, can, you can get big ones there. My son's personal best was right there at 24 inches last year and then uh and if that still doesn't work out for you you can go a little more south to uh rose and crown and rose and crown will most likely you know bring out a little bit bigger fluke and then if you got a big enough boat and you want complete doormats double digit fluke davis shoal which is a little bit of a hike from uh, Monomoy, but uh, if you got the right boat and the right weather, uh, you'll get your personal best there for sure. And then um, I, I see a lot of reports actually on the forums that a lot of guys that are going down to the shoals right now looking for fluke are pulling up big 20, 21 inch sea bass too. Oh, okay. So they're mixed in together there. So, uh, you know, get your gulp. Get your gulp and get your get your uh, jigs, and don't be afraid to put a big jig on the bottom with two teasers up top, two teaser jigs up top. You can actually use three. I, I know. Uh, I don't know. Jimmy the Greek actually, uh, great fisherman on time. Charles, he's he's a big advocate on uh, using three jigs on mm. one setup. So that's your fluke report. And Bruno, as you were just hinting at, uh, for sea bass, there are still some around out in the deeper water, as you just suggested. Oh, yeah. So, so Absolutely. yeah, give us a, a quick little report on what you've been hearing. Have any guys been pulling up any sea bass who've been bl- fluke fishing, or are there still guys yeah. going out kind of targeting sea bass? Yeah, for th- those of you guys that are members of MFCC and get to dive into the forums, you'll see that, you know, we're, we're very helpful for each other, and Guys are going down to Big Round Shoal and McBlair, and they're pulling up just as much sea bass as they're pulling up fluke. Great. So they're, they're there right now, so we'll see how long they stick around. Any reports, Bruno, this week from the Monomoy area, the rips at all? The rips are filled with sublegal fish, yep. 24 to 26 inches. 
you you can work a little bit farther out, stone horse. Okay. And uh, you might find the bigger fish there. It's all about the tide. I mean, it, it Monomo is one of those things. I, I went fishing there last week, and in the morning, it was all about a squid bite. And they were hitting anything that looked like a squid. And on the second tide, when it turned around, it was all peanut bunker bite, you yeah. know? So it's it's just one of those things where you just got to get out there and try it out. But in general, you're talking 24 to 26 inch fish out there. All right. That's good info. Also, Bruno, on my list of things to kind of ask you about this week are bluefish. Hearing anything about bluefish anywhere? Well, I know a lot of you tuna guys want to get on some bluefish to use for bait. Um, and I could tell you the best spot to get your bluefish for tuna fishing is going to be Point Rip. Um, almost not even at the rip, but almost in between Stage Harbor and Point Rip, mm. that coastline right there, if you troll a decent um, diver, you should be able to get your two, three bluefish uh, before you head out east for a bluefin. And talking about bluefin, Bruno, you mentioned last week you made a, a bluefin trip, and we talked about bluefin in Cape Cod Bay and up toward P-Town. And Ryan has pinged me this morning, and he's hearing reports of, you know, some big pogey schools up off Race Point and in the Provincetown area. Yeah. So have yeah, you heard anything true. about tuna or striper bite out at uh, P-Town? Yeah, there's, you know, if, if you're looking for a keeper striper, that's kind of your best bet. Mm. There's a, there's a you're going to get some 26 and 27s, but there's a, you're also going to, you know, if you work it long enough, you're going to get your 28 to 30 inch fish there. Um, they're on bunker. And what's funny is uh, just about every week, there's always a report at some point where the bluefin move in and they start crushing the same bunker that stripers on off race point. Interesting. Um, but what it's it's hit or miss. They're not there to stay. They come in, they feed, and they're out of there. So it's kind of one of those things where you got to be there in order to get them. But if you hear reports of it, it's for 30 minutes. So by the time you get up there, they're gone. Mm. You're either there and it happens, or uh, you know, or you got to be there and hope that it happens. But it, don't try to chase it because they're there and gone real quick. Also, though. If you're, if you're looking for a bluefin, I got to tell you, the bank, there's a lot of talk of guys catching fish up at the bank. Mm. At Stella. So that's not a far ride from Race Point once you're there. Last but not least, Bruno, I wanted to check in on the dealership, Cape and Islands Mitsubishi. How are things going down at the dealership this week? They're going great. They're going absolutely great. We just got a new inventory of pickup trucks. Ranging from twenty three thousand all the way up to forty five thousand, um, I got to tell you, uh, some of the pickup trucks we got in lately, uh, the prices have finally calmed down on the wholesale side, so we're able to price our trucks so that you just can't find a better price anywhere. So we're some we're having people come all the way from, you know, Rhode Island, uh, Boston, New Hampshire for our pickup trucks. And uh, if you're in the market for a pickup truck, before you go anywhere, look right in your backyard, right at exit eight. And as you mentioned last week, Bruno, you guys do a great job at customizing those pickup trucks as well. That's it, man. Pick out your truck. Tell me how you want it done. And we will totally customize it for you. Lift it. Put some tires and wheels on it. Get you ready to hit your trailer up to it and go fish it. All right, Bruno, I'll let you get back to your family, but Bruno Demir from Cape and Islands, Mitsubishi, down on Station Ave in South Yarmouth. Thank you so much, Bruno, for sharing some of your time with us this week. All right, you got it, man. Have a good one. Well, next up on this week's edition of the My Fishing Cape Cod podcast, we want to welcome in our good friend Phil Howarth from down at the Goose Hummock Shop in Orleans. Phil, how are you on this beautiful morning? Uh, it's certainly a beautiful day, Kevin. It's absolutely glorious out there. Somewhat envious watching, uh, just watching one of our boats go out, one of our pontoon rentals. Full of people going to the beach. It's kind of a beachy kind of day. There's a nice bit. It'll be good for boat fishing as well. 
Yeah, it sure is. It's flat, calm right now. Uh, I think a little bit after low tide here in Cape Cod Bay, and it's certainly a beautiful setting on a Saturday. Uh, I'm jealous with you, Phil. I'm looking out my window, and I can see the ocean, and I see a dog, actually, a golden retriever, swimming after a tennis ball, and I'm pretty jealous of him. Hey, uh, lucky hand. Looking at the fishing report this week, Phil, I want to start off with life off Nosset, and we touched on this a little bit last weekend, and you felt with the bait situation out there, it might be setting up for a little bit of a rush. So I wanted to check in a little bit to see if you had any more intel on stripers and blues from the Outer Cape beaches. Sure. Well, we're not really seeing any bluefish on the Outer beaches yet. They're still kind of down in Chatham. Okay. We'll come on to that later. Um, we have been getting bluefish in the evening. Uh, sorry, getting striped bass in the evenings off Norset. Yep. Um, it's, it's been better fishing in the evening if you can get on the dropping tide. That seems to be working the best. And they're pushing the pogies up. There's still plenty of pogies out there. And you can still walk on the mackerel off Norset. They're everywhere. Um, so, so I suppose, you know, from a beach perspective, yeah. You know, get, on that, get off the beach, low tide or falling tide in the evenings. They like a bit of dusk. You'll do just fine. And the boat scene off there, you know, the guys have been doing really well fishing on top of the pogie schools. And that's all the way at Norse, all the way up the backside, all the way to Truro. Have they been pretty much getting the pogies, Phil, with the snag hook and just kind of live lining them and letting them go? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You have to be slightly, you have to change your tactics slightly legally this year because you, in the olden days, you used to snag a pogie and let it drop. Mm. Whereas now, if you're using a live bait, you need to use an inline circle hook. So it's a case of snag the fish and then re, re hook it onto, your, onto a different rod and reel with, a, uh, with an inline circle on it, is the best way of doing it. And you can always put a weight, you know, what people are doing is they're putting a uh, egg sinker in front of it just so that the pogey actually sinks below the school, which is a techn similar technique as you used to do with, uh, with a snag hook. That's proven to be very effective as well, yes. Perfect. And we wanted to touch on tuna as well out east of Chatham and up at Stellwagen. Uh, it's been a pretty active tuna season here early on, Phil. What are you hearing about the tuna bite east of Chatham and then over at Stellwagen? Yeah, the, the tuna bar east is still on fire. You know, it's the, the due east of Chatham, Crab Ledge, et cetera, the sword, is still fishing incredibly well. The only challenge is the fish that are coming out there are all huge. Mm. So, yeah, there's a lot of big fish out there. You know, but some interesting, a couple of interesting stories for you. Yeah, one of my customers had a really exciting, uh, somewhat terrifying experience when he had a, he, he said he was, just getting to the final stage of a fish he estimated to be about 85 inches and he was just getting ready to put a practical grip in it to swim the fish to recover it mm. and a great white came up and took the third of the tuna in one bite oh. it didn't even shake it didn't even shake its head it just went crunch straight through it mm. so you know obviously then he had a legal fish because it was 73 under 73 <laughs> i jest obviously it's not legal at all but you know he, he cut his line pretty damn quick and let the shark enjoy his dinner um, and another cool story, which comes up slightly different, is one of my guys was fishing out there and he had a 54-inch halibut. Huge halibut. You know, there's a dinner surprise for you. But, uh, yeah, the fishing's still really good out there. If you get up and you get east of Stellwagen, um, so you get into the deeper water, um, some of the stick boats are reporting seeing smaller fish. Okay. Which obviously, is, you know, for, for my, my mainstay of my customers, is that's what they want to be going for. Mm. So the wreck fish are there. There's rumors of them south of the islands. I've got one of my friends fishing there today, actually, so hopefully I'll have more information on that. I dearly love that southern, south of Vineyard Islands fishery to come up, because that's great fun. So, yeah, so east is mainly big fish. Get on the east side of Stale Wagon and off into the deeper water, you have a chance of getting a recreational fish. Again, try trolling. Um, trolling has a habit of targeting the smaller fish, whereas a bait, you know, fishing bait will catch small fish, sure, but even more chance of catching a big one. And a lot of recreational customers, you know, you don't want anything to do with it. And speaking of uh, deeper water, Phil, something that we don't talk a ton about here is cod fishing. Uh, and one of the things Ryan wanted me to ask you about is the codfish fishery. Uh, is that fishery east of Chatham a viable option for anglers these days? It's a good question. I, I would say no mm. at a cod level. And the reason that is is the cods have got a worm parasite in them. So they just don't look very nice. They're full of worms. Yep. But they are out there. You get out to lane. That said, the, the haddock are not affected by it. Taste equally gorgeous, and they're in the same waters. Yes. So if you get into that, so 180 through 250 foot of water east of Chatham, you know, out, out towards the shipping lane, 
and beyond, there's been some excellent haddock fish in the last few weeks. There really has. Um, and it's a you know, wonderful table fish. And it's really easy fishing. You just drop a big perk down with a couple of teasers on it and jig it about a bit on the bottom. Yeah, I can attest, Phil, as to how good a table fare the haddock are for sure. Yeah, it tastes great. You know, and the top tip, if you do catch a cod, I'd release it. And what you want to do is quite funny. You just, you basically want to stick it in your live well, head down, mm. hold its tail, head down. And basically all the air bubbles, basically, excuse my English, but it's going to actually fart its way back to health. <laughs> and you just get get all the air out of it. And, you know, one of Brett Wilson, who's a very talented charter captain, taught me this trick for bait for cod, actually, at George's. But you actually dunk it head first and hold them down and they'll actually, the air will come out of them hmm. and they have a much stronger probability of uh, living when you actually throw them back because obviously they get, they, they take on air as they come up from these depths onto your boat. So there's a top tip of the day. Absolutely. Kids will love it, I'm sure. Yeah, great tip. And a little bit closer to home, Phil, want to talk a little bit about the Brewster Flats. Have you heard anything about how they're fishing? Yeah, the flats are still fishing well. The downside is with the flats is, you know, the, the bay gets very warm very quick. Sure does. Shallow. Yep. Um, I fished there on ooh, Tuesday, yes, Tuesday morning, sorry. It was a little lumpy. I was in the flats boat with my son and my wife. And we were on the flats. We were due to go out to Billingsgate, which I'll come on to in a sec, which is fishing great. It was a little bit lumpy in our little flats boat, so we decided to come into uh, the flats. There was about 30... Uh, anglers from the shore mainly fly fishing and we just sat outside them and we were catching schoolers one after the other yeah, it was great fun you know it's a lovely little fish they all went back um and we're fishing in two foot of water um but the bigger fish have certainly moved into the deeper water now from the flats and if you were really keen and, and trying to catch a bigger fish i'd strongly recommend you go there in the evening at night and if you do fish the night time just be very careful because the tide, you normally fish the incoming tide and the tide will come behind you mm. and carry a compass at all times just in case the fog comes in so you don't get disorientated. Yep. But that's certainly, if you want to fish the flat side, it's definitely turning. Earlier in the season, it was a, you know, you could fish in the day. It's more of an evening, nighttime experience now. And you mentioned Billingsgate a little bit there, Phil. I've been hearing some reports that that area is really heating up. Yeah, Billingsgate's been great. The guys are trolling. Whether you're trying the mojo, tube and worm, umbrella rigs, a lot of our guys are, are trolling the um, Sabeel Magic Swimmers. Mm. They've just got such a lovely swimming action. Yep. Um, and the deep divers are at the Rapala or the Nomad Divers. But they're picking the bigger fish off the edges of Billingsgate, yes. And you know, certainly that's, you know, and, and there has been some great surface bites as they push the sand dunes, the tiny sand dunes. But when they push those up, you can get on top of them, you're getting like an acre of breaking fish. And that's, yeah, that's been certainly happening, continuing to happen around the race as well. Yeah, that's what I wanted to get to. You and I touched on last week during our visit, Phil, about the fish up on top at P-Town. Is that still continuing? Yeah, it's still going on sporadically, yeah. Mm. You can find them and get on them, look for the birds, you know, look for these surface feeds. Um, they're getting up there on the sandals, getting up there on the pogies as well. So you're getting these really short but really intense bites. And if you can get on it, you're, just, you're sat in the middle of breaking fish everywhere. It's kind of like Nat Geo territory. It's fantastic fun. And you hit on bluefish a little bit earlier in our visit, whether it's folks, you know, going to look for a bluefish bait, you know, potentially for tuna or people that are looking to recreational fish for bluefish. You hinted at monomoy. That's an area that people could try. Yeah, monomoy, there's still a lot of squid in the rips and the, the, the bluefish are very active in the rips right now. Um, you know, great sporting fish, great tasting fish yeah, if you actually prepare them properly. Um, yeah, the, so Monomoy is a good shot. If you're more beach bound, Hardings is fishing well. It's a classic bluefish fishery. Um, entrance to Bass River is doing great also for, uh, for bluefish. And if you're on the bay side, along the old, you know, just west of uh, well float on the path, they're coming out as well. And yeah, the guys are catching them on umbrella rigs on Billingsgate, um, but it's more, if you're guaranteed you want to catch one now, I'd go to the, I'd go to the rips off Chatham. And the last thing I wanted to ask you about, Phil, just because I don't want to completely ignore it during our visits here on the podcast, is I know the Goose also offers a wide variety of equipment for the freshwater fishermen. And we know that Cape Cod has all these great kettle ponds to offer the freshwater angler. Are you getting a lot of customers kind of coming in asking about freshwater at all, or is it predominantly saltwater stuff? Good question. I, I think people are very... Yeah, you know, get very dialed into the salt water this yeah. time of year on the Cape. Yep. You know, bass, blue, and tuna are the staples. It's easy to forget that we have 
350, 400 ponds on the Cape mm-hmm. with some wonderful fishing. And again, you know, again with with the warm temperatures, it's turning into a, you know, early morning in the evening kind of thing. But my guys are all going out every day, and if they can't get on the ocean, they're on the ponds. Yep. Um, you know, Eric and Ian, who are my fly leads, are doing really well on the fly in the evening. Great. And the other guys are actually getting top water action for largemouth and smallmouth, which is you know, really exciting stuff. Yeah, you know, the trout, obviously, you know, that's dead as a dodo right now because they're in such deep water. Yep. Um, but that will come back in September, October. But the largemouth and the and a, and a small is yeah. Not all of my customers want to fish the beach all the time. So yeah, we're with our um, freshwater business is very buoyant. Yeah, you know, we just I've just placed huge orders for the fall with a number of vendors to to try and keep on top of restocking people as people look to go outside to not only enjoy the outdoors but actually enjoy it with a degree of social isolation, which is the uh, the thing these days, which kind of works for me and. I can't think of a better way to socially distance than be on or next to the water. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. The best way to you know, socially distance is be out on the water, whether it's fresh or salt. Phil, I want to thank you so much for sharing your time and information with us this week. Again, the Goose Hummock Shop down in Orleans is your saltwater or freshwater headquarters. Go down and see Phil and his outstanding staff, and they'll get you outfitted for whatever type of fishing you want to do. Phil, thank you so much for your time, and we look forward to chatting with you later on. Cheers, Kevin. Have a great week. Thank you. Well, my thanks to Phil Howarth of the Goose Hummock Shop down in Orleans for joining us on this week's edition of the My Fishing Cape Cod podcast. And a big thank you to all of our guests that took time out of their busy Saturday to join us today, starting with MFCC founder and creator Ryan Collins, Cape and Islands Mitsubishi's Bruno Demir, and last but not least, Phil Howarth from the Goose Hummock. And thank you, more importantly, to all of you for taking time out of your week or weekend to listen to this episode of the My Fishing Cape Cod podcast. We really appreciate it and all the great comments that you've been leaving on the website. I read them all, so keep them coming and let's keep the interaction going throughout the summer. That's going to put the wraps on episode number two of the podcast here this summer. So this is your host, Kevin Collins, signing off on this edition of the My Fishing Cape Cod podcast. Until we speak again, tight lines and take care. Thanks for tuning in to the My Fishing Cape Cod podcast. For the latest local news, information, and fishing reports, be sure to log on to myfishingcapecod.com. From all of us at My Fishing Cape Cod, tight lines and take care.